Thanks very much. Uh, it's brilliant to uh, be with you at the, uh, at the GLOW conference. Um, I feel a little bit like uh, the guy from New Creek who led the worship last night, uh, that I've got the golden ticket. Uh, if you cut me open, I, uh, I know I'm counties through and through. I've been with counties. Many of you know the work of counties, evangelistic work, uh, a work that's um, mostly based in England and Wales, but with a mission to the United Kingdom of making Jesus known. But I think if you cut me open, I still bleed GLOW. Uh, I, I, that's um, uh, genuine. I'm not saying that because I'm here, uh, but um, growing up as I did in Northern Ireland, in as Stephen said last night, a very, uh, a very conservative uh, Brethren Assembly background, Glow was uh, where I um, came up for oxygen, and uh, going on Glow summer teams um, really just uh, gave me the opportunity to. Um, test my calling. I didn't think I was testing my calling. I just thought I was going on summer teams and providing some entertainment. Um, but uh, uh, the Lord used it to, to lead me eventually to uh, leave my job in 1989 and to come here to GLOW, where Ray and Eunice were uh, leading uh, the college at that time. And I spent the year 89-90 uh, studying here at the GLOW College, now Tilsley. And um, from there, it went to, uh, down to England. Uh, there used to be, I don't know if it still happens in the same way, but the college used to run a, a, a week at the end of the year that was really um, a deputation week where the students would go for a week uh, to arrange the meetings to promote the work of the college. And our uh, week began with a weekend. In fact, it ended, I think, with a weekend at Newent in Gloucestershire. And uh, there was a man whose uh, funeral I'm going to be privileged to take part in, Theo Cracknell, who put his hand on my shoulder after that weekend and said, Martin, would you come back and spend a few more weeks with us? And that was a stepping stone to me uh, settling in that area of England on the Welsh borders, uh, Gloucestershire and then Herefordshire to serve the Lord full time as a county's evangelist. So we were there for 25 years. My wife Rachel is here and our three girls, Karen is 18. Uh, she's going to study nursing, God willing, in Swansea. Um, a little bit like Scotland. If you, if you, the Scots are very protective about their educational system, of course, um, but they, they fund it uh, more so than in England where you can accrue great debts. But my daughter discovered if you study nursing in Wales, they will pay for your nurse training. Uh, they'll pay your course fees as long as you commit to stay two further years with NHS Wales. So she's um, leaving home for five years. I don't know how we're going to cope uh, with Karen moving on, but uh, that's Karen. She's here, uh, sat over there. Not embarrass you too much. Hi, love. Um, Anna is 15, and Emily will be 13 in a few weeks' time. So that's uh, that's a little bit. Uh, about us. We, we, we moved just to complete the, the circle. We left Hereford um, two years ago, 2016. Uh, we, we were involved in a church planting ministry. Andy and Claire Gibson and their family were uh, with us for seven or eight years in that work, worked together alongside us. And um, uh, we, we've had the privilege of seeing a church established and we've left a church behind. About three years ago, we knew that God was moving us. And so when I'm coming to preach this morning on living by faith, it's been our experience to read God's word, hear what God is saying, and then have that internal challenge and conviction that you need to leave. You need to do something about what God's saying. And I'll say a little more about it tomorrow, but there's a, there is a cost. When you, when you were asked to leave, there is a huge cost. The challenge comes when you're asked to leave where God asked you to go. Yeah, some of you have had that. Some of you have left the mission field. See, Sammy here, I did teams in Marseille. God calls you to a place. He establishes a work under your hands. And then he says, now it's time to move again. That's really difficult when you've spent your whole life embedding yourself in a culture. And the cost is moving again. And that's a cost that we find um, extremely challenging as we moved two years ago to uh, Wiltshire. Um, uh, we thought Herefordshire was remote, and now we live in Wiltshire. Uh, I still haven't picked up the accent, though someone at Liberty Church said to me, where are you from? 
Uh, when I preach, I slow down. Because if you preach full guns with a Northern Irish accent, only the Scots understand what you're saying. <laughs> so in England, you slow down a bit, and it softens your accent a bit. I, um, uh, my mum and dad are both with the Lord now. My mum went to be with the Lord in December uh, last year. But when she was in hospital a few years ago um, for surgery for uh, bowel cancer, I um, went into the, uh, into the bathroom. I'd flown home to be with Dad and just help him for a few days. And I went in the bathroom and realized I hadn't brought a, a towel in with me. And I shouted, Dad, Dad, the bathroom door was unlocked. Dad. And he said, what? He said, I, uh, this is back in Bangor, Northern Ireland. I said, Dad, can you bring me a towel? And he, uh, he stood at the bathroom door. He said, a what? I said, a towel. And the more I pronounced it with two separate distinct <laughs> syllables, the less he understood it. And I thought, I, I mean, he can hear me. His hearing wasn't great. A towel. <laughs> he said, son, I don't understand what you're saying. I said, oh, ah, a towel, a towel, dad. He said, a towel, why didn't you say? A towel, okay. Uh, we're going to um, look at this subject of, uh, of living by faith. And we're, um, this morning we're going to think about foundations, the foundations of living by faith. Then tomorrow morning we're going to think of the cost of uh, living by faith. And uh, I don't know if Stephen had got someone uh, better lined up for the teaching tomorrow night. My name's not on the program, but if it's me, I'm going to look at the, um, uh, the champion of our faith. If it's someone else, you can have my notes or do something, uh, do something else. Um, we're going to read from Hebrews chapter 11. So if you have your Bible uh, with you, you want to turn to, uh, to Hebrews 11. I'm reading it from the New Living Translation. So apologies if you're following in a different translation. I know so many different uh, versions, copies of the scriptures are used these days. I do tend now to do most of my preaching in the New Living Translation, really because it's a much simpler English. And often I, I uh, presume, not obviously in this conference, but often we're preaching to mixed uh, crowds and congregations of people where uh, m people are more generally biblical, Ill biblically illiterate than they were when we were growing up. And uh, so I find the New, the new Living Translation is uh, really appropriate. So I hope you can follow along. We're going to read the whole of the chapter. So Hebrews 11. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command, and what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. It was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man, and God showed his approval of his gifts. Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. It was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. For before he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about things that had never happened before. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world, and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. And even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith. He was like a foreigner living in tents. And so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. It was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child, though she was barren and was too old. She believed that God would keep his promise. And so a whole nation came from this one man who was as good as dead, a nation with so many people that like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, 
there is no way to count them. All these people died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. Obviously, people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. If they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promise, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. It was by faith that Isaac promised blessings for the future to his sons, Jacob and Esau. It was by faith that Jacob, when he was old and dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and bowed in worship as he leaned on his staff. It was by faith that Joseph, when he was about to die, said confidently that the people of Israel would leave Egypt, and he even commanded them to take his bones with them when they left. It was by faith that Moses' parents hid him for three months when he was born. They saw that God had given them an unusual child and they were not afraid to disobey the king's command. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. It was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. It was by faith that Moses commanded the people of Israel to keep the Passover and to sprinkle blood on the doorposts so that the angel of death would not kill their firstborn sons. It was by faith that the people of Israel went right through the Red Sea as though they were on dry ground. And when the Egyptians tried to follow, they were all drowned. It was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days and the walls came crashing down. It was by faith that Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God, for she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. How much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back from the dead, but others were tortured. Refusing to turn from God in order to be set free, they placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at, and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. Some died from sto by stoning. Some were sawn in half, and others were killed with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute, oppressed, and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised. And God had something better in mind for us, so that they would not reach perfection without us. Let's just pray and ask God to bless the reading of his word. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for this very special passage that we have read that reminds us by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. And Lord, we come before you with honesty and we confess that sometimes, Lord, we just love to, to see and get others to see. Lord, we'd love sometimes more um, concrete evidence, and yet faith in the reality that you speak through your word 
provides all the concrete evidence we need when we trust you and you prove yourself time and again faithful day after day, month after month, year after year. Father, we thank you that there are many in this room who can attest to your faithfulness as they have sought to walk by faith. So, Father, we pray that you would take your word and speak by your Holy Spirit, apply it to our hearts and lives. Father, we have come some uh, with the successes of a summer season, but many with the burdens and sorrows and heartaches of another year of ministry with its challenges and obstacles. And so, Lord, you know our hearts, you know our situations. Lord, you know the turmoil in some minds here today. We pray that you would minister, encourage, challenge, and change us by your word. And we pray this in the name and for the glory of your son, Jesus. Amen. The foundations of living by faith. Um, some time ago, I did a, a study on the uh, subject of hope. And I made a distinction there, and I don't think the distinction fully holds true biblically, but uh, I, I made a distinction that faith in one sense was backward looking and that hope is forward looking, but that's not what you find here in Hebrews 11. The faith is consistently identifiable as that hope in something that is sure and certain, that is future, that is to come. It is faith in something not yet, but which will absolutely be. Saving faith, we often refer to as looking backward. Of course, it's looking back to a, an event that happened, the death of Christ. Christ, who knew no sin, became sin for us, that we, through him, might become the righteousness of God. So we look back to a finished work. He completed the work on the cross, and we praise God for the resurrection, uh, historical events that took place in which we have placed our faith. We have put our faith in Christ and that historical moment that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, that he raised again from the dead, according to the scriptures. However, living by faith as a way of life is closely related to this thought of biblical hope. It is forward looking. It's drawn to a future goal, a vision not yet fully realized. Some have said that vision is the ability to foresee a preferred reality. So when you're working with visionaries, they constantly pushing you and, and encouraging you to see something greater. We're, we're working now, Rachel and I, and the girls have settled in a church, Queensway Chapel in Melksham, and a good, loving church, a, a growing older congregation, uh, but with a heart for the community. And um, I, I was reminded, and we've been reminding them something of a mantra. It was something that Tim Cracknell uh, has said, who has um, uh, seen a church established and planted in Cinderford in the Forest of Dean. Uh, Tim consistently told the group of older ladies who were the, um, uh, the remnant of the old gospel hall he inherited in that little town in Cinderford, those seven ladies, he consistently encouraged them with these words. It takes selfless people to grow a church. It takes selfless people to grow a church. And we've been, we've been reiterating that and teaching it and emphasizing it from the Word of God. I, I had an email exchange last week with um, the, uh, the, the chief steward in the church who's on the doors and does a lot of the practical work for the building. He's a lovely uh, Christian man, but he's quite old school. And I was told when I arrived at the church and complained quietly to someone that the coffee was dreadful. Um, uh, I was told, well, you'll have to get it past so-and-so. He will never see a change in the coffee. Well, I had an email exchange with him last week uh, about the coffee. Um, I, and you say, really? It's about the coffee now? That's what it's really about? No, but what we're trying to encourage the church, he said, there are 20 or 30 people who drink the coffee. There can't be anything wrong with it. The only thing wrong with it is Christians are too nice to complain about anything. Well, actually, that's not true. 
usually do complain about lots of things, as you know, if you lead a church. But the, the point is, it's just a symptom of the fact that, look, we live in a culture that, that it lives in this way, and we want to be welcoming. We want to give the best to people when they come in. We want to be the most welcoming, the warmest, the most encouraging. So when they come in and they come for the first time to your church, to your meeting, to your, uh, to your service... Um, someone has said, before you get up to preach, they have already made up their mind about your church. They've already decided. What was the welcome like? What, what, were people friendly? Did anyone speak to them? How did they speak to them? Did they feel judged? I mean, th- these things are important. So we, we're consistently on this, um, on this mantra, it takes selfless people to grow a church. And, and people who are forward-looking consistently challenge us to see things as they ought to be, not as they are. We might be content, but God doesn't call us to be content. He calls us to have that sense of holy discontent as we look forward to a greater future. And as we want to see, to some extent, his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, we want to see the influence and the work of the gospel make a difference in the lives of the people around us. We want to see lives change. So in Hebrews 11 verse 1, we we read, be good if you you keep the the passage open, we'll refer uh, regularly to some of these verses. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for, or as the New, New International says, it's, uh, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This kind of faith, being convinced of something that is real but is not yet visible, is what is commended. Believing God for something that is real but is not yet visible. God says it and He asked me to believe it. It's real but I can't see it. That's the challenge, the tension of living by faith. That's what uh, verse 2 says, the Old Testament saints were commended for. They trusted God and they were commended for it. I've been listening to the autobiography of this guy, George Muller. I I didn't know he'd written an autobiography. Actually, he didn't, but there's an accumulation of his letters and his accounts that have been put together. I don't know if it's available in physical print, but it is on Audible, so I have downloaded it. And I have been thoroughly enjoying it. it, Most will know who George Muller uh, was, but uh, if you don't, George Muller uh, came from from Germany and uh, settled in England in the uh, mid-1800s and established a huge orphanage work in Bristol reaching thousands upon thousands of orphans at a time when the need was huge. But what I've been really challenged by as I've been listening to Muller's biography is the reason, the number one reason why he did the work. Now, clearly he did it for the glory of God and because he believed that um, uh, people should hear the gospel and respond to the good news of Jesus. But Muller recounts in his autobiography that he was saddened that ordinary Christians would not trust God to meet their daily basic needs. He was saddened that ordinary Christians would not trust God to meet their daily basic needs. For example, he recounts a conversation with one brother who was so busy working early and late that he had no time for his family, no time for the meetings, and no time for the Word of God. 1830s. It sounds like the... 20 teens, doesn't it? I'm too busy. I've got to work extra. I've got to do overtime. I've got to stay late at the office. I have to do it. If I don't do it, I can't earn enough. I have to do overtime. I can't afford to live. I can't afford to put food on the table. I can't afford my rent or my mortgage. And Muller said they were missing meeting with God's people because if they didn't put in the extra hours, they couldn't make ends meet. Or they were unable to commit time to personal devotions and prayer because they were too tired, and they were too tired because they were too busy. So Muller consistently recounts in his autobiography, in the notes that he wrote, in the letters that he sent, in the reports and accounts that he kept, that the primary reason he began the work of God amongst orphans in Bristol was so that without fundraising or making of public appeals, trusting God and praying to him alone, he could prove that God is faithful to meet every need. It's remarkable, isn't it? 
that by simply trusting God and praying to him and making our needs known, God is able to meet every need. Now you, many of you are not surprised by that because you've proved it. You've proved it week after week, year after year, that God is faithful to meet your needs. It's difficult, isn't it, when you're struggling, when the car is broken down or uh, a tax bill comes that you hadn't expected. The tax system when you're self-employed in the United Kingdom is um, complicated because it's done retrospectively. And so a bill can come that if you haven't made an allowance for. In my early years, um, when the tax system changed, I hadn't made allowance for uh, the fact that, you know, I got a wife, I got a house, my income had gone up because my support had gone up because God's people were faithful and we got a tax bill uh, for um, about £1,800, £1,800. We had nothing. We, we had enough to live day in, day out, but we had nothing to pay the tax bill with uh, other than the £2,000 check that came in the same day from uh, uh, an elderly gentleman who had supported our work. And when it came in, I opened the post and I was, yes, fantastic. And then I opened the tax uh, bill and I was, thank you, Lord. (laughs) I had other plans for it. Now that's, you know, those kind of things weren't happening all the time. But when I read Muller's Muller's, uh, book and listen to Muller's story, I think, you know, I was called by faith to trust God. I left my home. I came to Motherwell. I ended up in England where I knew hardly anyone. And yes, I didn't have a different language and different food. Part of the reason I didn't go abroad was um, my uh, food issues. Someone saw me with salad on my plate yesterday. I hope you were impressed by that. But uh, uh, Godfrey Miller was a guest teacher here at the college uh, when I was studying here. And um, uh, he watched me the week um, that he was teaching Uh, I was thinking about going to Italy. I was praying about going to all sorts of places. I think I'd written to missionaries in Alaska uh, as well as Italy and France and other places. And Godfrey Miller just looked at my plate one day and he said, don't go abroad. I said, sorry, don't go abroad. He said, why not? He said, you'll just offend everybody. You'll not win anyone for Christ if that's all you're going to eat. Thank you, brother. Well, he was right in a way. He was right in a way. I mean, by God's grace, my diet has improved somewhat. A little too much, perhaps. But um, uh, So God leads, but he leads you to take steps of faith. But the challenge for us who seek to live by faith is to have the same confidence in God today, day in, day out, for our daily needs that we had when we left. You find that difficult? I do. I find it easier to make the big decision... And see God's hand of grace and provision and mercy, then day in, day out, trust him to meet my daily needs. All believers are called to live by faith, but some of you here, many of you here, are in the privileged position of demonstrating to Christians and non-Christians alike that where God guides, he does indeed provide. And that's a testimony. That's a testimony to the church. It's a testimony to other believers. And that's a testimony to the world. And so verse 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And so I just want to look uh, briefly in the short time I have left at two simple foundation stones, two building blocks for our faith. Just two of these. So, uh, number one, if you're going to have faith, you must believe that God is, that God exists, coming to him in prayer. Anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. In the West, we're living in very confusing times. I was talking to Magdalene Bird about the Republic of Ireland and the huge changes that have taken place there in a very short period of time. We're here in Scotland where secularism is hugely on the march, where the government is deliberately taking steps to secularize the nation as quickly as possible, marching in exactly the opposite direction of biblical foundational principles and truths. Do you know that simply by believing that God exists, you are counterculturally testifying to the reality? Of the God of the universe. God exists. When you pray. When you give thanks. When you say to someone. Well God provide it. I was um, 
talking to our uh, neighbors across the road. We, we, we prayed that God would lead us to a house where we could be a testimony with our neighbors when we moved to the town of Melchim. And the people directly across the road, they've, um, uh, they've got three children and their little boy has got some uh, disabilities and challenges. And um, I went over, Emily, our youngest, was playing with their eldest and I went over just to introduce myself. It was a Sunday afternoon, and I, I said I, I would have come over earlier, but we had uh, lunch at church today. So, um, you know, we had promised that Emily could play on Sunday afternoon. So I was sorry I was late. It was the very first time I'd met the guy, so I wanted to make an introduction. But when I knocked on the door, a baby started crying upstairs, and I thought, oh, typical. I've woken the baby. And uh, the baby was screaming. He was totally distracted. He said, oh, that's uh, Roma. I've just got her to sleep. And now she's woken. And I was like, hi, I'm Martin. I'm your neighbor. I was kind of going to say, hi, I'm David. I'm from that house, not this one. Um, but uh, he was looking at me and the baby's crying. But the moment I said church, it was as though the baby didn't matter anymore. He said, oh, church, you go to church. I said, yeah, we're, um, we go to church. Which one? Queensway Chapel. What's it like? Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, what do you say to what's it like? Yeah. <laughs> It's all right, it could do, you know, could improve. But it's all right, it's where we go, you know. He said, uh, where is it? And so all these questions came one after the other, like machine gun fire. And I said, do you go to church? He said, no. He said, but uh, the baby crying is a miracle baby. So we're dabbling, we're investigating, we're going to a messy church event at one of the Church of England churches. And I praise God, it's opened a door for conversation. Now, two weeks, three weeks later, their next door neighbor, uh, so he was directly opposite, their next door neighbor, invited us to a housewarming event. We're on a brand new housing estate, so everyone is new who's moving in. So we couldn't go, we were away, but we went over to apologize. And I, um, she said, what do you do? What brought you to Melcham? So I said, I work with a Christian charity sharing the good news about Jesus. And um, she said, so you're Christians? I said, yes. What sort of Christians? Wanted to say really good ones. But. So I, what do you say? I said, evangelical. It's a d difficult word. People, if they understand it, might have a negative view of it. I said, evangelical. She said, are you born again? I said, yeah, we're born again. Oh, she said, my mum's got born again. My sister's got born again. I'm surrounded by born again. And I wanted to say, and your neighbors are dabbling. But... Um, <laughs> But, but just, just saying a word, God is. He exists. There was a comment that we have a Facebook uh, page for the residents of George Ward Gardens, and mostly it's whinging about the bin lorries not turning up and complaining about the quality of building on the site and so on. But someone posted last week, uh, look out, God people are going door to door. And there were all these negative comments. I don't know who the God people were. They could have been Jehovah's Witnesses. I don't know who they were. But I put a comment, and some God people live here too. And I had a couple of likes, little thumbs up. And uh, the guy who posted the original comment commented with the simple, okay. So I don't know what that means. But um, faith is a simple declaration that God is. That's a huge testimony in our world. God is. You pray. Yeah, I pray. Why do you pray? Because I need God. And God is. God meets my needs. God's answered so many prayers. The um, uh, Sky Television did a report in advance of the Pope's visit to the Republic of Ireland last week. And they were talking about how tens of thousands are leaving the Roman Catholic Church because of the uh, crisis, particularly the um, sex and abuse crisis that the church, uh, the Roman Catholic Church there has faced. But they interviewed John McCarthy. Uh, John, John McCarthy is, uh, uh, was an Irish international surfer. And when he was living in Australia, he said he got a Bible because he thought there must be more to life than this. And through reading the Bible, he came to faith in Christ. And now he belongs to an independent church in the Republic of Ireland. And they interviewed John and he gave such wonderful testimony. And his actual words were, um, I, I'm not religious, but I do have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. 
What a testimony in a nation that's rejecting the shackles of religion. There is a God and you can know him. Faith is a declaration that God is. Look at verse 24 about Moses. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. It was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. What do we know about Moses when he was living, as the King James Version says, in the backside of the desert at a burning bush where God attracted his attention? He was drawn in to God's presence. And he says to God, when I go down to Egypt and I speak, who will I say has sent me? Who are you? I am who I am. And I love when you get into Exodus 31, you read these words about Moses. Inside the tent of meeting, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one would speak with their friend. Isn't that exciting? That God encourages you to come into the tent of meeting and to get to know him personally. But to do it, we've got to believe God is. And believing God is, is a testimony. Relationship, not religion, is something we preach and we share and we discuss. But is it true of me today? How religious have you become on this journey? It's so possible, isn't it? In 2005, I uh, got ME, chronic fatigue syndrome. I was talking to Andy and Claire who were with us at the time and I really, uh, my health took a real hit. I had to clear my, my diary for six months completely and then just slowly rebuild my work. But I know in my heart and I knew at the time, it was burnout. It was burnout. And the work of God had replaced God in my life. The work of God, as Ryan said to us at the very beginning, the work of God had replaced God in my life. And I was serving a different God. I was serving the God of ministry. And God used that opportunity to break me and to give me the opportunity to come back. So the first foundation stone is God is. Well, what is the second? Look at verse 3. I'll put uh, verse 3 uh, up on the screen. Uh, By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command. And what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. It's a brilliant verse, this, but as I was preparing and reading it, I I couldn't help but think, what on earth has it got to do with forward-looking faith? By faith, we know that the world was made at God's command. And I was thinking, well, that's using something that is to encourage us to believe in something that we cannot see that God has said will be. And then I thought about creation. It's about something visible, this verse, the known visible universe, whereas the rest of the chapter is about what's invisible, unseen, future, not yet. But here's the link. What we do see, the world, came, um, we believe came about by God's word. We believe by faith that God spoke. Let me take you, uh, let me take you back to the moment before creation. Imagine if such a thing's not um, uh, ridiculous, that uh, where there's nothing, you exist it. Um, and you are there in the moment before God speaks and says, let there be light. And God turns to you and he says, Martin, Dave, Brian, Sandra, uh, I'm going to say in, in a moment, I'm going to speak. And where there is nothing, something will exist. In fact, where there is nothing, everything will exist. Now, I don't think you could get your mind around the concept, first of all, because if you don't understand anything and there is only nothing, how can you imagine something? 
I don't know whether you would have believed God, but if you could have been put in that situation and then God spoke and said, let there be light. And God spoke day after day and things sprang into life and into being. And you saw from one moment to the next, this amazing creation. And it all came about through word, the word of God he spoke. So it is the same faith. The, the writer to the Hebrews is saying, I want you to retrospectively realize that everything you see, taste, touch, feel, experience, didn't exist once. And God spoke and it is. You see the connection between verse 3 and the rest of the chapter? It wasn't, but God said it and it is. It wasn't, but God said it and it is. If you had been there, would you have believed God? But now, says the writer to the Hebrews, you're living in the reality of what God spoke. It was not. Before it was, God said it would be and it became. And now we believe that retrospectively, don't we? We do believe that. God spoke and it became. Now the writer to the Hebrews says, look, if God gives you a promise from his word, if he calls you to go and he says he'll provide for you, if he tells you that he wants you to lead a new church or disciple people or bring people to faith or preach the gospel, do you believe that God will bring about what he's calling you to do? Yes. I can't not do it because everything that is, is because God spoke it. So we live in the evidence that God's word is absolutely fundamental. So what God says now by his word, we can be sure will be invisible now, but real, true, absolute. And so as we seek to step out in faith, live by faith, trust God with our needs, hopes, dreams, families, futures, we can trust him if he has said it. Between 1847 and 1850, uh, George Muller believed that God was calling him to build a new orphanage. There had been a complaint from residents in Wilson Street where they were renting four houses. There were complaints the children were too noisy. They were uh, creating a distraction. And George Muller actually in his journal writes that if he had lived next to the orphanages, he would have found the children distracting too. And he said, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And he prayed about it and God gave him the vision to build from scratch. And he thought in his heart, well, it's going to cost £10,000 just to build an orphanage, not to house 100 that he was currently housing in Wilson Street in four homes, but a house that would house 300 plus staff. Actually, uh, in three years, he received £15,000 while still receiving other monies to support the, uh, the children. He received £15,000 up to 1850, which is the equivalent of £2 million today, over three years, without once writing a letter of appeal. <laughs> and that house was the first of five that he built over the next number of years. And each one of them came about because God spoke, Muller trusted, he prayed. And God did. Folks, I'm excited. I'm excited that God can do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. My problem is I don't ask enough and my imagination is shockingly limited. But God can do immeasurably more than all that we ask or imagine. By faith we understand the entire universe was formed at God's command and that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. How do I keep going then through the tough, challenging times? Well, what does God say? What promise, dear friend, dear Christian, what promise did God give you when he called you? What did he say? When I left Northern Ireland, God gave me a verse in Genesis as he spoke there to Jacob and he says, go to the land that I will show you. And God had put England by that stage England was on my heart. God had shown me England. And at my bedside in Northern Ireland, I was called to leave and go to England. Go to the land I will show you and I will be with you wherever you go. That's what I've got to trust. God spoke. You go and I'll be with you. So may God help us as we build on these foundations the testimony God is. God exists. I can trust him. 
and God speaks. What's he said to you? What promise, perhaps this morning as we're going to move shortly into a time of reflective prayer, what promise has God given you that you just need to come back and say, God, I, I hear what you're saying. I need to trust you. Help me to put my faith again in you. May God bless his word to us. Thank you.